Shabbat. My name is Ronnie Shacha. I'm going to uh, host this uh, event. Um, and, whoops. Let me start by a story. It's a story of a guy by the name of Joe Nussbaum from California, who something like a little bit more than 10 years ago, decided he's going to do a short movie. And uh, basically he was a fan. He was a fan of uh, a movie called Star Wars, of a franchise called Star Wars. And he decided that his movie is going to be some kind, something like a homage and spoof at the same time of both Star Wars and uh, Shakespeare in Love. That movie actually won uh, an Oscar award in that year. Uh, he actually got a little bit money from his grandfather, forgetting grandfather and grandmother. Uh, he hooked up with a few of his friends from the University of South uh, Carolina, and he shot that movie of nine minutes. And let me show uh, the first one minute from that movie. So basically, this is a young guy doing a movie, nine minutes, short film by his friends, uh, about George Lucas, who he admires. Here's what happened. Even though it was just a nine-minute movie, people start speaking about this movie. And eventually, a few months later, it was so, there was so much interest in the movie that Amazon decided to sell the movie in its e-store. When this movie was sold, another thing happened. The fourth episode, well, the fourth movie in the Star Wars franchise, which is actually the first episode of the Star Wars, uh, was also launched in Amazon. So now you have the movie, the Star Wars movie, is being sold in Amazon, and a spoof by a fan. And you know what? That movie, that nine-minute movie, sold more than the real thing. And I find this as a remarkable because it sort of demonstrates how important are consumers in not only movies but in, in brands today. And what I find as remarkable is a person like George Lucas, who was behind the Star Wars franchise, realized that 15 years ago. 15 years ago, he realized that the brand, as we call it today, is not only owned by the firm, but also by the consumers. And in order to create brands that work, you need to have a collaboration between consumers and firms. And I think that's what we are going to see more in the next decade. And what's remarkable about that is that George Lucas and later on the people who stand behind The Matrix, the three movies of The Matrix, realize that as well. This is one of the reasons that I'm so excited about the movie industry. The movie industry has always been in the frontier of many phenomena that we know. There are other reasons to be excited about the movie industry, like its involvement and its effect on politics, on democracy, on culture, on advertising, on so many aspects. So it's one of the most interesting uh, industries. And because I'm so interested in that, I would rather not say anything because we have two experts here with us who are going to speak about those industries and to show with us their experiences. So I'm going to be short in my things and I'm going to let them speak. But before we do that, this event uh, is actually not only sponsored, but it was made possible by the Dick Siegel family. So I want to invite Guri Meltzer, a friend of the family, to say a few words about Dick Siegel. And you will need this. Uh, 
Uh, one wonderful crowd. I would like to say a few words about Dick Siegel, whom I have known for many, 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 many years. And the reason I'm speaking here today is not only because I've been a good friend, a very close friend of, of, of Richard M. Siegel, who is known as Dick. It is also because of manager, as a manager in the Israeli business community, I observed and lived the changes Dick led in academia, in business, in Israel. And a result of his pioneering work in marketing, Dick was a consultant to many leading firms in the country, trained managers and marketing executives. Dick, who's, uh, who has uh, the fund that I will speak about, thank you very much. Dick made Aliyah in 1958 as a marketing consultant after a few years at Exacto, marketing manager a company that dealt with knives mostly in the, for the hobby applications. Many of the people who are sitting here in this hall cannot even com understand and comprehend the pioneering aspects of Dick Siegel's uh, work and the importance of it. This reminds me of a course that I gave in this school, in the management business school. And uh, one of the professors visited my lectures and commented. And at the end, he visited all the lectures. And he said that he enjoyed the lectures very, very much. He couldn't understand if I wanted some feedback. And he, and I said, oh, obvious, I want some feedback. And he said, you are doing two things, two bad things. One is you are apologizing much too much to the students. And secondly, you are trying to teach the students to come on time. I said to him, first of all, the first comment you have is because of uh, the, the education that I received. Uh, many, many, many years ago. And as far as the teaching the students to come on time, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying an experience I had in this school about coming on time. So he said, you are teaching the students to come on time and you are not going to be successful. I said to him, we are going to New York and uh, we are spending a few days in New York and uh, we want to learn a lot, a lot about the um, American big industries. And I said to the students, we, when I say that we have to be at 9 o'clock in the morning, I mean 8.55. And obviously I was there quarter to eight, quarter to nine. And uh, how many students were missed it? Not a single one. Not a single one. All came on time and all came on, on the time. I would like to continue about the Richard Siegel. Richard M. Siegel. Who's, who is very well known as Dick, as I said before. As I said, many of the people who are sitting here in this hall cannot even understand the pioneering aspects of Dick's work and the importance of it. Today's marketing departments and obvious 
uh, are obvious. And the teacher, and, and they teach the difference between marketing and sales, which was one of the things that Dick was trying to do. That was, there was not even a word for the word shivuk, for the word marketing, because the word marketing, today you are, you are attending the marketing department, and many of them are doing the master's degree in marketing, and none of uh, the people know that the pioneering, pioneering aspect of marketing was done by Dick Siegel. The majority of marketing terms have been adopted from the United States where the subject of marketing began to develop over 50 years ago, the terms were created and used by people engaged in marketing and by those who did research work. Did one of, Dick was one of those people and he was probably one of the better ones. Just an example of an idea of free samples is part of our to their life today. The first one who came with the idea in Israel 50 years ago was Dick. I can remember that one of the kibbutzim who were make, making the baby food asked for Dick's uh, help. Dick came and proposed to them to give free samples to pediatricians. Pediatricians are baby doctors. And uh, they, they did not accept this uh, suggestion. And I'm afraid that one of the reasons they had to close the factory not a long time after that it was that they rejected, that they did not accept Dick's brilliant idea. The second aspect of marketing is the packaging which Dick was trying to introduce into this country. The packaging of many, many of the candies. Now, after 50 years, Dick would have enjoyed the professional doing which happens in many, many, many companies. Don't worry, I will not. It's only the third page, and even the third page is uh, a very short one. So I'm not going to speak very long. Dick Wall had a wide scholastic background and amongst his uh, many, many varied interests, he had an extraordinary feeling for linguistics and he was a master of many languages. He knew fluently Japanese, by the way. Japanese was one of the words, one of the languages which was spoken by the intelligence of the Americans where Dick served many, many years. As a close friend of Dick, I would like to ask and urge you to, to support and contribute to the Richard Siegel Fund for Marketing Research. The fund was established in 1971 by friends and associates of the late Richard M. Siegel, or Dick. The income of this fund is devoted to the promotion of the marketing research in Israel. The fund was also uh, provides the acquisition of new books for the marketing section in the library of the faculty management. And specially sponsoring uh, occasions like this of tonight. Next, I would like to invite Professor Eliasberg to give his lecture about the movie industry in the United States, correct? And then we will hear another lecture about the movie industry in Israel.
יהי זכרו ברוך. And I'm so, I'm so sorry that I'm using these words because I don't know how to say these words. יהי זכרו ברוך. I don't know how to say it in English. Bye bye. Okay, so the next speaker is Josh Eliashberg, professor from Wharton. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about hearing him. Uh, this is a person uh, who did the following. <clears throat> he wasn't only influential in terms of academics and did many, many interesting things about the movie industry, but this is a person who was also able to... Yeah, but... He was also able to uh, bridge between academia and practitioners, and I hope he will tell you a little bit about that. But he was also able to bring some ideas from academia to the practitioners and back. Josh, welcome, and you should use this. Okay, good evening. Uh, as Ronnie said, I've been doing work in this business of the movie industry uh, for the last, I hate to say how many years, but quite a few years, since the early 90s. And this is the first time I'm giving this presentation actually here in Israel. Uh, you, can't, you can't hear me? Can you hear me there at the back? Can you hear me? How come they can hear me over there and they can't hear me over here? <laughs> what do I do? Only. This one? Use this one? So remove this one because they make the... I was going to say Ahad Rash. אני יכול ללכת איתו? תן לי. אוקיי, can you hear me now over there? same thing? this one? and this one? and the... That's good. All right, let's get started. So what I'd like to do is, first of all, still not good? Yeah. 
All right. Uh, let me start, for those of you who are not familiar with the industry, with some background information, and that also will help me to position the work that we've been doing here. And when I say we, I want to give initially the credit to many of my doctoral students, uh, many colleagues who worked with me, and we basically, uh, from the point of view of the movie industry, we see the following situation. Movies in the United States, they start the release theatrically, then they move to foreign markets, then come another uh, window of opportunity, which is the pay-per-view, and next you see the home entertainment space, all the way to syndicated TV. Uh, these gaps are getting shorter these days, and I'm sure you all know that the movie Avatar was actually launched, released simultaneously in the U.S. as well as many other uh, foreign countries. And uh, the work that I've been doing had to kind of focus initially here on domestic and uh, foreign theatrical release. I've done also work with some studios on their home entertainment uh, business. And I'll focus today mainly on this space here, uh, domestic and theatrical release. We're looking at the following uh, statistics. 2008, U.S. market generated $9.8 billion. 2009 is a record year. It exceeded $10 billion for the first time, which indicates that, you know, despite the fact that we have a generation that doesn't like to go to the movie theater, there is still business that comes from these movie theaters. Uh, next, you see that the foreign markets generate more revenues to the studios. 2008, they basically, uh, we have 65% of the revenues coming from foreign markets. Again, this is how the domestic uh, theatrical release uh, looks in terms of box office revenues. The supply chain for movies, I presume it's the same thing here, but in the U.S. you have the producer and the distributor. The distributor today is one of the major studios such as Paramount, Warner Brothers. They used to, in the past, produce also the movies, but today they find it's too risky, so they move more and distribute movies and the movies are produced more by independent production firms today than by the studios. An expert in the supply chain are the exhibitors. <coughs> and here in the U.S., oh, there are a number of dominant exhibitors, such as Regal Entertainment, that has about 7,000 screens out of the 36,000 screens in the U.S., this is a very consolidated industry, and it's undergoing changes pretty much every day. Every time you open the newspaper, you see that some bigger uh, ex exhibitor purchased some smaller one. A lot of changes are happening here in this space. And finally, there is the audience for the movie. So this is the supply chain. In terms of the money that they spend... Okay, so the budget in 2007, on average, it cost $71 million to make a movie. And this budget includes what you pay Mr. Tom Hanks, Mr. Spielberg, you know, all those characters who know how to charge for the services, and $71 million to complete the production. Here is where marketing starts to play its role. On top of the production, there is another $36 million spent on, it's called PNA, print and advertising. Print, that's the physical reel that they send to the exhibitors. Each print costs about $2,000, and if you distribute a movie in the U.S. on 3,000 screens, which is decent, here goes $6 million that is charged against, against the budget here. The rest of the budget is spent on advertising, TV advertising, publicity, and marketing. So, $106 million before you start to see one penny coming from the box office, this is your investment. 
And I like this graph also because the graph helps me to share with you the kind of work that I've been doing. I started actually working with movie exhibitors, and in a few minutes I'll tell you exactly what I did. But this is how I got into this industry. And actually, like many other things in my life, this happened by pure luck. Uh, before I got into the movie industry, I used to do a lot of work on new product development, new product forecasting, new product design. And it was back then in early 90s where one of our alumni, Wharton alum, he came to me and he said, you know, I've heard about the work that you've been doing on new products. We have four new products that we have to consider each week, four new movies. And we have to decide whether to give them space, give them screens, or to play some existing movies. So we have these kind of decisions, you know, every week. What can you do? I don't know how I many of you know about the Wharton School, but I don't know any faculty member at Wharton who would say, I don't know how to do that. So we said, let, let us think about it. And this was my initial kind of project with movie exhibitors, and it evolved into a long-term relationship. It started in the U.S., evolved into a long-term relationship that we have with movie exhibitors in, uh, actually, in Europe. Next thing came the movie distributor, okay? And the distributor is facing a very different uh, problem. The distributor has the following options. Should I take the movie straight to the video store? Or should I give the movie an opportunity to play in the theater? If I go to the theater, what is the right amount of money I should put behind this movie? As you can see, this is an average money, okay, average budget. But if the movie is likely to generate strong word of mouth, I don't need this much money, okay? Word of mouth is free of charge, so why spend so much money? So those are the kind of the options, decisions that the movie distributor is facing. And we've done some work here helping the movie distributor. And again, I believe that I'll have time to share this work with you. We've got some reputation here. And the reputation led to another phone call one day. And the phone call came from a movie producer. And the phone call said, basically, look, we heard about what you, your colleagues, your doctoral students did for movie exhibitors, for movie distributors. What can you do for us? We have a movie script. And based on this script, we have to make a green light decision, to green light it. And the decision is $71 million on average. Can you do something with scripts that will tell us anything about the commercial viability of the movie? And like I said, we don't know how to, do, how to say we don't know how to do that. So again, we said, let's think about it. And over the last three or four years, I find myself reading scripts. By background, by the way, I'm an electrical engineer. I never thought I'll read scripts in my life. Uh, it's fun. Uh, but it's more fun to see sometimes reactions from audience when you tell them, you know, that we take a script, we develop a, met a methodology that helps us to evaluate, to compare the script against some other scripts, and to come up with some estimate what would be the box office of this movie. And I find it kind of fun to see sometimes how, you know, the audience eyes get wider and, and wider, and I can read also, you know, that some people in the audience say, this professor lost it, and this is fun for me, okay? But anyway, that's what we do now. So we work with movie producers today. We work with a number of uh, private equity firms. In the private equity uh, space, traditionally, they used to write a check to the studio, check for anywhere between four to $700 million, and they told them, you know, make movies from, with this money. Uh, as I'm sure you know, you know, situation in the credit market in the U.S. got worse and worse. So the private equity firms became more and more careful about how this money is used. If you look back 10 years ago, everyone had money. You gave the studio three or $400 million, and the studio would take the money and invest it in very risky movies. They would not invest it in Harry Potter. They would not invest it, you know, in anything that you know in advance that you have an opportunity here and that you can recoup your investment. They invested it in very, very risky businesses. So these private equity firms later became more cautious and said, you know, 
We want to know exactly, and we want to also the say in what movie specifically you invest, you invest our money. That's where they approached us and they said, you know, we have like a portfolio of 10, 15 scripts. Can you help us to decide what should we tell, what we should tell the studio in terms of where exactly we want to see our money used? So that's basically what we're doing here. Uh, let me start here. If I can move this slide now. Let me start with the exhibitor. A few more statistics, you know, I'm sure you, it's true here too. There are a lot of uh, multiplexes today. Okay, multiplexes are 46% of the screens. And my multiplex has anywhere between 8 to 15. And you start to see more and more megaplexes being, you know, uh, built in the U.S. And they have more than 16 screens. Total number of screens in the U.S. is around 39,000. We start to see also more and more digital screens. And I believe that this is a good business to be in. I believe this is a good business to be in, despite the fact that some of my colleagues think that, you know, everything will ultimately go to the Internet, video on demand. I believe that the experience of watching movies in a theater when you are sitting next to some people whom you don't know is a hell of a different uh, experience. So I believe this is a good business to be in. So you're doing fine. Uh, this is the penetration of the digital, digital screens in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. And the U.S. now has about 5,400 screens, which are digital screens. And uh, one more thing in terms of the relationship between the movie exhibitor and the movie distributor in order to get a better economic feel for what we are doing here. The exhibitor and the distributor, they shine a contract. And the nature of the contract is such that movie, say Avatar, that plays, you know, week one, about 95% of the box office revenues go back to the distributor. The exhibitor keeps only 5%. If Avatar may play, say, 12 or 15 weeks, the exhibitor share of the box office revenue gets larger, can go up to 50% even. So that's the standard contract between movie exhibitors and movie distributors, which basically suggests that if you play the movie longer, your share, and that varies from one theatrical chain to another, but typically, if you play the movie longer, your share from the box office revenues gets larger. All right, so these are my colleagues, Sanjeev Swami from India, Myself, you know, U.S. and Israel, Chuck Weinberg from UBC, University of British Columbia at Vancouver, and Biren Winger from Erasmus University in the Netherlands. This is the team I worked with on different projects for, movie, uh, for the movie exhibition. And it started, like I said, this Walter Malum said, you know, can you test whether we are really efficient in terms of showing the right movies, showing them for the right period of time, and showing them to the right audience? These were the questions that he asked. So what we did, we did some analysis, and this is what we call retrospective analysis. And what you see here, this is one facility with six screens, 27 weeks, these are all abbreviations of movies. So, New York Store is here, played on screen number one for two weeks. This is the largest capacity screen. Move for another two weeks to screen number two. Move one more week, screen number three. And, oops, it doesn't appear anymore. Somebody decided, this is called the booker. The booker in this particular chain decided... It's not worth for us to play New York stories in week six. Uh, here is another example. Indiana Jones was double screened here. Double screened, double screened. And here it moved to a single screen. And again, the question was, can a human being make these decisions without leaving money on the table? Okay. So what we did here, we did what's called retrospective analysis. We had the data, this uh, alumni, uh, the Walton alumni, he gave us the data, 
And what we did here, we estimated how many tickets New York Stories could have sold had it played also in week number six. And we kind of evaluated this particular schedule. And what I'm showing you, this is just but one example. We've done it for many, many other theatrical facility, for other periods, for other uh, number of screens. So this is just an illustrative example for what we have done here. And this is the set of movies that this theater played, 43 movies. Okay? And we developed a system. It's called Decision Support System that has two capabilities. Capability number one is, again, the forecasting capability. If New York Stories played five weeks, I have data for five weeks, I can project, in fact, any, any undergrad at UPenn can project what will happen in week six based on five historical data points. So we projected. This is the forecasting capability. The second capability is allocation. Okay? The movie that has the highest demand should be allocated to the largest capacity screen and so on. With these two capabilities, this is silver screener, we came up with a very different schedule. And as you can see, we believe that New York Story should have played longer. And in estimating the profitability based on the actual schedule against the schedule that silver screener recommended, we came up with the conclusion that this particular case 38% room for improvement in the performance of this theater. So we've done those kind of analysis for a long time for maybe many uh, movie theaters, and every time that we've done it, we found that there is money left on the table, and the rules, there is room to improve the profitability anywhere between 25 to 40%. The problem gets even more complicated because, again, if I continue with this particular example, at that particular time period, there were other movies available here that the booker, for some reason, chose not to play on this theater. They are number 44 to 87. So now we tell Silver Screener to select the best schedule from the 87 movies. And the question is, how can we estimate the box office for this movie, The Abyss, for example, which did not play in that theater? Well, this is the advantage that you have when you do what's called retrospective analysis. This same movie, The Abyss, played elsewhere in the U.S., and you can rely on the information that comes from elsewhere to project what would be the ticket sales in the particular theater of interest. This is the advantage. This is why we call it a very conservative analysis, because I have advantage here. I know how each of these other movies performed elsewhere. So, with this advantage, information advantage, we asked Silver Skinner to choose from the 87 movies. Silver Skinner came with some other schedule, and the bottom line is that now there is 120% room for improvement. Again, we've done this analysis many times for many theaters, and we convinced ourselves that there is money left on the table here. And there are two sources of errors that the typical exhibitor makes. Error number one is playing too many movies for too short time period. Error number two is not playing the right movie for the clientele that is around the facility. With these two errors, money is left on the table. Okay? So we felt that there is room here to add value. Now, to kind of get back to the story, we tend to be slow, okay? Yeah, we say that we always know how to do everything, but we also tend to be slow. By the time that we finished all of our retrospective analysis, the CEO who approached me resigned. And, you know, when the CEO resigned and you have somebody else, and this somebody else said, we are doing fine, don't bother us, we were basically left with a theoretical result, which is, hey, Money left on the table here when these bookers make decisions. So, fortunately, one of my colleagues is a Dutch professor, and at some point he had a relationship with a Dutch exhibition chain called Pathé Holland. Pathé Holland is subsidiary of a large exhibition company called Pathé. They operate, Pathé has headquarters in uh, 
Paris, and they operate in Paris, in uh, Belgium, in Holland, all over the Europe. And Pate Holland is a subsidiary. They have about 150 screens in the Netherlands. So you can imagine, we have a meeting with the CEO there. His name is Mr. Nielsen. We are four professors. Okay, actually only the three of us, the guy from India, couldn't make it. We made a presentation there at Pate. And we end up, we basically ended up telling this Pate uh, management, you know, we've done all this retros retros retrospective analysis and we feel that there is money left on the table here. Well, initially he looks at us as kind of, uh, you know, strange people, but then he was, he had courage. And he said, you know what, you sound, you know, somewhat reasonable, let's run an experiment here. Let's run an experiment. And the experiment that we decided to run was, let's run for six months the silver scanner with one particular theater at this city called Butenov, at this theater, which is in The Hague. It's a six screen facility. And this facility will basically make the, or decide what movies to play based on your system. At the same time, let's find two other facilities in two other cities, no silver screener, business as usual, the way we used to book these movies, you know, over the last 50 years or so. And let's say if we see some difference here. So, with this in mind, I'll give you some results. So this was six months. These are some results. The metric that we used here was the percentage change in visitors 1998 vis-a-vis -vis 1999 how much the theater generated more tickets. So 1991 in percentage vis-a-vis -vis 1998. Here are some examples from some weeks that cover this experimental period. Week number 45, Budenhoff, the one that had the silver screener, showed increase of 2.9% from 1998 to 1999. And the other two theaters, one was located in Rotterdam, the other one is in Groningen, uh, showed decline. Decline here in Budenhof, but larger declines here. And we basically had a meeting at the end of the six-month period, and we evaluated all the results. And in about 95% of the weeks, the Budenhof showed higher performance relative to the other two. Well, the reaction now was, you guys don't look as strange as you looked initially. You seem to add some value to our operation. Why don't you now schedule for us all the theaters that we have in Amsterdam? They have six theaters in Amsterdam, 41 screens. There are some issues when you try to schedule movies in multiple theaters. The key issue is what's called cannibalization. We addressed it, I'll save you the, say, the technical details here. But in Amsterdam, and you see we start writing a, chapter, a book right now, so this is chapter 3, the performance in Amsterdam. We basically uh, demonstrated that there is room for improvement too. Magnitude was 4.7%. 4.7% relative to the other theaters that did not receive any uh, recommendation from Silver Screener. That was, uh, in terms of monetary terms, $250,000 over four months. You multiply it times three, you get saving of 750 euros. That was fairly significant for Pate in Holland. And those things took time. This is what we call the proof of concept. And quite frankly, we were not paid during this time period we had an opportunity to access all sorts of interesting data and to write all kinds of exciting academic papers. But in academia, they appreciate collaboration with industry. Okay, and that made it easy for us to publish those papers. And as we kind of establish this relationship, then they keep asking us to do more and more. So the next thing that happened here was, this is chapter number four now, they asked us to do micro-scheduling. So let me explain what the micro-scheduling is about. Here is a schedule of movies in one particular theater, in one evening. This is a 13-screen facility. And this movie started at 6.40, 
I ended up at 8.20. The next showing started at 9.50. I ended up at uh, 11.30. So they told us, look, you help us to decide horizontally what movie you should play on what week. We need now a vertical assistance. When should we start the first showing? When should we start the next showing? Uh, we have to make sure that there is some time here that is needed to clean up the uh, screening room. We don't want too many movies to end up at the same time because this generates crowd and consumers are not very happy. All kind of requirements. This boils down to some very interesting mathematical problems. And again, the first thing that we did was to take one actual schedule and see if we can improve it retrospectively. And we developed another model here, it's called Silver Scheduler now. And Silver Schedule is a model that takes into, into account the theater opening and closing times, time between showings required to clean the screening room, avoid uh, the crowding, don't start the same movie in two different screening rooms at exactly the same time, all sorts of requirements that came from the management. With those requirements, we generated another, more, another uh, schedule, and I'm sure you can see that it has more shaded area. And when we, when we evaluate the number of slots, these are all 10-minute time slots, there are 975 of them. Actually, the utilization was 66%. We showed that it can be utilized more to 79%. And in doing so, while maintaining all the requirements, you can increase the number of visitors. That was the retrospective analysis. Later came another six-month experimental period. And no pay, just academic papers. At the end of these six months, now we started a company that installs software in each of these Pate Cinema facilities. We're talking also now with Pate France to expand the software support for other theaters. And that's pretty much the end of the story as far as my involvement with uh, movie exhibitors is concerned. Some lessons. First of all, I find that it's much more fun to do research uh, in the movie industry than in package good industries or some other boring industries which I was very heavily involved before. In fact, yeah, that's much more fun. Number two, the exhibition industry is very centralized. Pate Cinema has headquarters in Amsterdam and this Amsterdam office decide what movies plays in all of Pate Cinema theaters all over the country. In the United States, there is a main exhibition chain, AMC. They have a regional office in New York City, and this office is responsible for deciding what movies will play in New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And it's hard to believe that somebody sitting in New York can tell what's the preference of the local clientele, okay, in a state such as Delaware, okay? And this is very different from the retailing industry. If you look at two Kmart stores, they may be located in the same city, just three miles apart from each other, and you see different assortments of products. Why? It's because the local manager decides what sells, what doesn't sell. Centralization leads to inefficiency, so we find that. Another lesson that we find is that consumer behavior in the United States is very different from, you, from, Israel, uh, from Europe. And my kind of uh, involvement with project here that we do with Avi Edry suggests that it's probably that Europe is similar to Israel. How does the consumer make decisions about movies in the U.S.? Movie first, theater next. So I want to see Avatar, what theater near my home it's playing. So movie first, theater next. In Europe, I like this theater, Tushinsky, in Amsterdam. Let me go there, 7 o'clock, let me see what's playing, and I'll make the decision over there. Israel, from our involvement here that we had, it's even one step further. I go to, center, to Cinema City, I see what's playing, but it's part of my decision process. 
because there is a cashier there. She may recommend also, you know, what movie to play, to show, to uh, attend. So the cashier is also heavily involved in the decision-making process. I don't see that in Europe, but again, that's differences. We call it cross-cultural differences. Uh, what else? Movie ratings. The U.S. has this MPAA rating. And it took me a while to realize that the U.S. is extremely conservative. Uh, we have some comparisons. I don't know if you can see the numbers. Bottom line is really that a movie rated R in the U.S. gets PG in Holland, gets G recommended for the entire public in the Sweden and Norway. They are way conservative. Okay? Spain and Italy tend to be also non-conservative, and R-rated movie in the U.S. gets, you know, for the entire public in Spain and Italy. Uh, and, again, when we did this project with the movie exhibitors, okay, I didn't mention that, but let me go back. When he kind of come up with a schedule for the movie exhibition, let's say, in Holland, now, if you have a new movie, we no longer have this information advantage that we had when we did the retrospective uh, analysis, because this is a new movie. We have to somehow forecast what will be the ticket sales for this n uh, new movie. And the approach that we took was to characterize any new movie on about 20, 25 characteristics, such as genre, major actor, major director, what time or what month the movie was released, the same movie, okay, with the same actor, director, if you release it in July, it will perform differently than if you release it in October. So what month the movie was released, based on these characteristics, we basically looked at the database, this is called data mining, and we looked at the database that we compiled in the theater, and try to find out what is it similar to, and this is how we made the forecast. You okay? It's okay. Okay, so you see, uh, when you are actually implementing these kind of models, decision support systems, you no longer have this competitive uh, information advantage. You have to make some forecast. It's not 100% accurate, but it's based on evaluating similarities between a new movie to existing movies on multiple characteristics. Okay? And I felt that we can do better. And I've always been intrigued by ability to focus new movies because over time I also had friends from Hollywood and they told me it's totally unpredictable and you know this is kind of a challenge when people tell you it's unpredictable to prove that you know it is predictable so Our next project was with a movie distributor. Movie distributor. And here we developed a different type of a model, a model that requires actual inputs from consumers. Remember, when we did the silver screener and the silver scheduler, we relied on historical t ticket sales. Here, the distributor, before they release the movie, they can do pre-screening. They can bring a bunch of consumers to a theater, show them the movie, ask questions about the movie, assess the uh, word of mouth that is likely to, to be generated from this movie. We have a different kind of a situation, different setting here. So we worked with a movie distributor here. And we developed a model. And the model, called the movie mod, basically takes as inputs the movie, because the movie has already been produced. It's now pre-release forecast, prior to its release. So the movie, the segment of consumer it goes after, the advertising material has already been prepared, and the media plan and the distribution plan are ready. With this in mind, 
we bring a bunch of consumers to a facility and we test the advertising ex- uh, effectiveness, word of mouth impact, how the concept uh, appeal to the movie. We plug in all these inputs into a model called movie mode and movie mode predicts on the output what will be the penetration of this movie in the market that they are trying to target and it gives also diagnostic information in the sense that how the results are sensitive to the various marketing variables that go into this uh, uh, program. So, briefly, the model basically simulates the type of consumer groups that are formed in the marketplace when movies are released. And this is based on all sorts of focus groups and surveys that we've done. And we find out, you know, this is not rocket science. There are a number of groups that are formed when you release a movie. Group number one is the, mo- is the group that probably lives on a different planet. They're not aware that the movie is playing, you know. You, be- but you, can, you can probably uh, test that too here that, you know, in the U.S. probably you take a random sample of 1,000 people, about 50 of them don't know what Avatar is. They never heard of Avatar, they don't know it's a movie, they don't know it's playing right now in the theater. This is the unaware. This is people who live, in my opinion, on a different planet. Then you have another group here that says, Oh, I heard about the movie, I know it's playing, but this is, you know, Friday the 13th, Freddy Krueger is back. This is not my cup of tea, we call them the rejectors. Incidentally, another insight that I learned from this analysis was that when it comes to movies, people show very strong opinions about them. You know, if you have to decide between one soft drink or another, you are not as opinionated as you are with respect to movies. And we found people who told us, you know, if Jennifer Lopez is there, count me out. We found people who said, you know, if Alec Baldwin, that's enough for me. So they move directly from becoming aware to rejectors. Then there is another group. They have the movie on the wanna see list, but they, are still, they still need more time before they attend the movie. We call them waiting adapters. Another group have seen the movie, liked it, tell you know, others to see that. Third group hated the movie, and they tell all their friends, stay away from this movie. And finally, we have a group of consumers that someone start talking about this particular movie and talks about some other movie. These are the six groups that are formed with respect to any movie. And the challenge behind the model here is to capture the flow from one group to another. And how long it takes to move one consumer from the waiting adapter, for example, to become either a positive or a negative one. And if we know how many positive ones we can also give the distributor information related to how much information is needed here, how much advertising is needed here. Is it going to be basically based on word of mouth, like what we call sleeper type movies? Or you really need to support this movie continuously, not only week one, but week one, two, three, four, and so on. That's the essence of the model, and I won't bother you with the details, but let me take you now to application or implementation of this model in Europe, actually. So, the distributor in Europe with whom we work was a company called RCV. And I didn't show you the movie yet. Where is it? The movie was Shadow Conspiracy. So, Shadow Conspiracy made about 15, 20 million dollars in the US. And the distributor was asking us, is it worthwhile for us to play it in theaters in Holland? So, the distributor, RCV, had also some kind of a base plan, how to advertise and how to promote the movie. So, they felt that they'll start with some trailers, this is average intensity, week one. They will add more outdoor advertisements, week two and continue adding, this is the week when the movie is released. You see, so a lot of marketing, promotional activities during this week. One more week of support, that's it. That was their base plan. And we need it as input for our model. We need this as a critical input for the model. 
The distributor, RCV, also told us, you know, we're going to play it on a large screen for one week, and then it'll move to some small screens. So we had the media planning and the distribution plan. With this, as well as pre-screening, questionnaire, 200 consumers, we came up with... Uh, we came up with the following predictions. This movie, as we told the distributor, is going to generate roughly 13,750 tickets. Okay, the attendance we predicted would be 13,750. 13, so this didn't look like a good number for the distributor, and we were asked now to make suggestions to the base plan. And we discussed with them all sorts of options. Option number one was... Let's add some newspaper advertising in week 7. Remember, the base plan was we advertise it all the way to week 6. Week 6 is one week after the release, and we no longer support the movie. That was one option. Option number two, let's add some extra articles in magazines. Week 6, extra commercials on TV. Week 4 and 5, more trailers in week 4 and 5. So we basically took each of these options one at a time and generated a prediction what would be the box office ticket sales if we change the base plan and incorporate any of these options. The results look like this. Base plan, as we estimated, will be 13,750. With option number one, it can go up to 14,260. With option number two, 14,780, option number 3, 18,770, and option number 4, 17,390. So initially one would argue, why don't you choose 3? It turns out that from a cost-benefit analysis, this is the most expensive option. So they did the cost-benefit analysis, and ultimately they chose to adopt recommendation number 4, which was more trailers, Increase it from 13,000 to 17,000, but in a cost effective manner. So that was the project that we did with the, with the uh, distributor. Uh, what did I learn here? I strongly believe that what really drives consumers to a theater is word of mouth, and not only word of mouth, word of mouth from a friend whom you trust credible friend, friend who you believe knows your tastes in movies. That's number one. Uh, we found also some challenges to conventional uh, wisdoms. Some distributors feel that whatever the critics say, you know, is very influential. We found, we found that criti critics have very little influence on getting consumers to the theater. Very little influence. In fact, I did another study with another colleague of mine later where we looked at many, many critics, many, many movies. We found very, very weak correlation between what they say and what drives consumers to the theaters. When I was doing this study on the critics, I found also a critic that he, who is very, very informative for me. This is the guy, his name is Joe Morgenstern. He writes in Wall Street Journal. And I did an analysis between his recommendations and my enjoyment of movies, negative 0.95. So you can imagine what happens now. It's Friday morning, I get my Wall Street Journal, I read it. Morgenstern said, I hated this movie. I tell Mrs. Elias, we have to see that tonight. So this is informative. In general, they have very little say in what drives consumers to the theaters. I'm sure you all know the U.S. industry now in the uh, print media, magazines, uh, newspapers. They're not doing well in terms of business. And guess what department they close first? The, critic, the movie critics department is the one that is asked to leave first. So that's one insight from this study. Another interesting insight working with the distributor was how the distributors and the movie industry tend to segment markets for different movies. They use age and gender as two segmentation variables. 
Okay, so for example, they'll say this movie is for male 16 years or older. This movie is for females, you know, between 10 to 16 years. We found, as well as many other colleagues who have done this kind of analysis, that age and gender are terrible segmentation variables. In fact, there is a concept which is called chick flicks. Are you familiar with chick flicks? These are the movies that, you know, presumably are not supposed to like. And as I go to more and more of these movies, I find I like them more and more. And when I talk with my colleagues, I also find that they love them. So something is wrong here in using gender, you know, in determining, you know, whether or not this is a movie for males or females. Right? Some classic examples include uh, Pretty Woman, that all of my male friends loved. There is a uh, Julie and Julia, that all of my... So the whole concept, I believe, of chick flicks is basically worthless. In fact, we've done some other analysis trying to identify segmentation variables and we find that the unobserved variables such as your opinion, your attitude, and your interest in different issues which run across different genders, this is much more critical in identifying the segment for a given movie. So what you don't observe is more important than what you kind of observe. Yeah, the funny thing here is that, you know, the, this is how they also run the tree screening, okay, so they feel this is a chick flick, they take a bunch of uh, girls in Westwood, California, that's where they do most of the tree screenings, and they ask them to come to the movie, and they see, they, they test whether they liked it. And again, this leads to poor prediction, if you rely on gender as the key segmentation variable. Uh, all right, we have some more time, let's keep going here. So, like I said, we've written all sorts of research articles. We got reputation. Some people refer to us as nerds. Others refer to us as some other terms. Bottom line is that one day we get this phone call from the producer. And the producer has scripts. Let me ask you a question. How many here are from the film department? Because at this point, when I start talking about using scripts to predict box office, most of the film department students tend to leave the room. How many people are here from the film department? All right. So, the producer is facing this kind of budget, $71 million. Does it make sense to try to get some feel for that? Is it worth spending this money? We were approached, and now my colleagues are John Zeng, another colleague of mine at the Wharton School, and Catherine's you. He used to be a doctoral student, now he's a faculty member at NYU. And we started to analyze scripts. So what kind of information can you extract from a script? You can tell what the genre is. You can do content analysis. What is content analysis? Content analysis basically amounts to asking a number of film students to read the script and to respond to 25 questions in terms of yes, no. What kind of questions? Is the ending surprising? Yes, no. Is there a conflict in this script? Yes, no. Is the conflict resolved in a reasonable manner? Yes, no. This is done by, like I said, three students from the film department, and we look what kind of issues they fully agree on. So we test what's called the convergence in terms of opinions. We also take what's called natural language. Okay? Let me make another one point in terms of the practice, first of all. How do you think they greenlight movies in the business? Somebody make a pitch and then they have a meeting and hopes the conclusion is this is Spider-Man meets Batman. This is too high level comparison of a new script. This is too high level. What we do here, we go after the DNA of the script. What is the DNA of the script? As I said, it's based on content analysis and it's based on natural language, which means we look, for example, how many dialogues are in there, and this is done by the computer, there are all kind of recent software packages that we use, and it looks for how many dialogues are in the script. Is there, is there one character in the script who takes over the entire dialogues, or are the dialogues 
distributed fairly evenly across the characters. How many words it takes the screenwriter to describe a scene? Okay? And at the end of the day, we look at all these characteristics, compare them against the data set. At, at some point, you have to make comparisons. So we compare them against the data set, and in this data set, we have other scripts that have already been made into movies. And the comparison is just done much more fundamentally than this is, you know, Batman meets Spider-Man. It's done at a very fundamental level. We worked here with a number of producers. Their reaction was basically, and a number of also, like I said, private equity firms. And each one of them gave us what they call a slate of uh, scripts, like 6 to 15 scripts. And the reaction was... We don't necessarily trust the numbers that you gave us, but we find your work of value because it helps us to see from an objective point of view what is our most attractive and what is our least attractive asset. Okay, so we don't necessarily believe that if you say this script, once made into a movie, will generate $50 million, that we take it with a lot of grain of salt. But if you say that script X will generate more than script Y, this is interesting for us. Because either it confirms our judgment, and if it doesn't, we just get together again and spend another two days to discuss why is it that these professors come up with a very different ranking for the assets that we have. So these are the type of reactions that we have heard so far. Um, close to finishing here, so I won't bother you now with the DVD stuff that we have here. Uh, I just want to finish on a personal note, if I may. And the personal note that I want to finish is the following. I have one daughter, and for about 15 years she gave me hard time. And she said, Dad, you work always with the movies, you meet with, you know, presidents of uh, studios. Have you ever met an actor or an actress? It took 15 years to get to this picture. This is, I don't know if you recognize her, this is Kelly McGillis, Top Gun, okay, witness. Took 15 years. So now I'm a cool dad too. Thank you very much. First of all, I will uh, introduce myself. Okay, good instance. Thank you. My name is Avi. I'm uh, co-managing uh, Cinema City in uh, Gilot. I think most of you know the, the place. Uh, I'll try to give you a, a, sl a slight brief of uh, the... I said the know-how of Cinema City and, the, and some of the decision-making that we, that we do with accordance with the, Mr. Ellisberg's work. First of all, uh, the cinema business has changed in the last 20 to 15 years, changed from, from one side to the other side. Just to give you a number, I think in the, in the, in the middle of, this, of the 60s here in Israel, there was close to... Uh, I think this 60 million admissions, 60 million went to see movies here in Israel. Just to give, in, in uh, 2009, it's going to be close to uh, 10 million. So, we, the, in, the, the film industry suffered the, the video uh, revolution, the DVD revolution, the, now the internet revolution. So basically, what we are, we are suffering in the last years is the... We're trying to, to understand and to, and to build uh, the movie or the, for me, the exhibitor uh, business again. Because uh, although the, 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 the options to see a film have, have changed, the cinema business, it's still the same chair, the same screen. And we're trying to, uh, to do miracles in this uh, new or old uh, industry. 
just to give you a small uh, slight brief, we are using the same machines in, in the cinema that were used 100 years ago when cinema was invented. Only in the last year, the digital cinema was entered to the cinema business and we're doing a change. So we're, we're trying to, to uh, find how to make new business in very old uh, businesses. Uh, basically, we started in, in 2000. We, we work, our our uh, firm is working, uh, is doing business in the cinema business for the last, I think, 30 years. But it, uh, in 2002, we came to an understanding that something, has, something new has to be... Uh, has to be done. Uh, this is small numbers about Cinema City in uh, Glilot. We have uh, 25 halls. We show 250 screens, different screens a year. Uh, and maybe to your surprise, we, we are now doing, we have 25% of all the Israeli viewer, viewers market in one place. And uh, it's surprising, and this is, this is uh, directly connected to or related to the, the, the change of thought of the change of, of that we see in the, in the cinema business. It's close to, we have close to 3 million visitors a year. The, 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 the basic change is in, in the cinema business is, uh, as, as we see it, uh, in the, la the last uh, revolutions in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ways to see films is uh, that people no longer go to, uh, the, to the cinema to see a film because film you can see on your couch with, uh, with your warm blanket, with the popcorn uh, from the microwave and uh, you can see it better. 60 inch uh, plasma screen. But what we understood that we had, where we uh, it was proven to us that people are, as a, as a, a social a creature, like to go out, like to, to meet new people, like to, uh, to, to, to sit next to another person, and to have a collaborative, uh, uh, let's say, screening, collaborative uh, thing to do with other people, with his girlfriend, with other people. People like to go out of their homes. So this is, a, a, this is the, the notion of Cinema City. We took the cinema, and we, we, put, we put it as a, as a one a piece of, a, of an evening. You see a film, but before you go to a, a restaurant, afterwards you go to a pub, it's a, it's a, all, it's a, it's a new kind of a way to go out at night. This is the, the essence of a Cinema City. With this revolution of Cinema City, with connection to what uh, Mr. Ellersberg said, we're now trying to make some kind of a revolution in the, in the, consumption, in the consumption of of the audiences of, of uh, movies, how to make, how to uh, cause more people to go to cinema, how to uh, to take one film that uh, in cinema go uh, people see it in an average uh, weekend, let's say ten thousand people, how to to double it, how to take a, 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 f a film that we see as a good film and make it better in terms of numbers. Uh, not many many people will will tell you, but. Uh, we cinema is a business. We, we, our goal is to make money from, from uh, cinema. We are in the, although we are, we are the last in the, in the chain of, uh, of cinema business, but, uh, and we're not doing it for, for art, we, we tend to make money. And that's why uh, the work of uh, Mr. Ellsberg is, is very important to, for us as, a, as an exhibitor because this, this is the 5% that you saw, this is the difference for us as a struggling industry. It's a lot of fun, a lot of stars, a lot of uh, uh, big things, but eventually not a lot of people go to cinema. And, and I think in the last uh, years we're doing uh, some kind of a revolution and getting back people to cinemas with all the, the work that is done around it. Just also to give you a glimpse, we, we see our uh, cinema city as not just a cinema, but also as a leisure center, a place where you go out and have fun. It's also, we, we, we try to do some kind of an education to the Israeli audience. Because Israel, people used to, to, to see cinema as general, there were Israeli cinemas, or Israeli films, as you say, Borekas, Borekas, Sote Borekas. And cinema is not a cultural event. We try to, to increase it, to, to move the, the cinema business to a cultural point as a as a theatrical uh, event, in order to cause people not just to go out, want to go out to, to a film to have fun, but to have to gain something from the film.
something that they're not doing now. We also uh, do a, uh, we, we see a cinema city as an education center, a media platform, I want, want to go through it. Each line that you see here is, a, is one of our uh, businesses that we're doing in the cinema city. This is the chain of, uh, of, uh, that goes through the film. The, the producers usually sit in the United States, deliver the film to a local distributor here in, is, here in Israel. We are on the, on the last line, the exhibitors that get the, the plastic, get the, the, the PVC material, that they, they, they tell you, okay, screen this film on, the, on your theaters. We don't get any uh, other information. Where to put it? Will it succeed? How, it will, how will it do? And eventually we are in charge of bringing the money back to the investors, back to the, 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 the producers of the, of the film. So, as it seems, uh, we're not stars, we don't, uh, we, we're not sitting in Hollywood, but all the, the investments that are done in Hollywood are sitting on our uh, shoulders. So, we, have to, we, we take this, uh, this challenge in the very... Uh... So, this is, the, uh, this is the, the sum of our problems. First of all, we have uh, high and constant expenses. Uh, I bring the, the same cashier each day I'm paying uh, in salary. I bring the, the, the same usher, the same guy that sells you the popcorn. They all operate the same cinema at the same time. So even if I bring a bad movie that will bring only one audience, I have to, to have all the employees in the, in the, in the theater. Uh, I want to give you 100% satisfaction. I, can, I cannot do for less because other, 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 uh, if you come... You won't come in a, to the cinema in a different day. You won't come to the cinema at all because they say, okay, cinema is rubbish, I won't come, to, uh, come again. Uh, in each, like in each industry, I have to have a, a, a competition. Cinema is the limited resources because I have 21 screens. I have the ability to show 40, 45 different movies and I have to choose which film I, I need to, to, uh, to screen in my, in my theater. The main problem is the film that I get, the product that I show the audience, I, don't, I actually don't, I know nothing about the film. I'll, I'll just, uh, in, in, in the next uh, slide I will show you what I know, but, but basically I don't know anything about the film. The film, as you've seen in, the, in, the, in Mr. Erzberg's uh, lecture, has a very short period of uh, screening in the cinema, something between uh, two to six or eight weeks, so I have to, to do all of my business in a very short time, uh, and, I have to, and I have to decide if to give it another chance or, or prolong the, the period, the period uh, of uh, the screening of the, of the film. And as I said, we don't know nothing about the, the film. So the question that we, that we ask each day is, uh, can we predict the success of a film? Because we get the film, or... We, we, can, we can get the film. We have to decide if you want this film or not. And we have, we have to decide whether, in which theater to put it. The next question is, is if we as a cinema, with the lack of our resources, can influence the, the, the success of a film. We don't do the publicity. We don't do the poster of the film. We don't uh, choose the actors. But eventually, uh, we get the film. We, and we have to, to ask ourselves, can we, can we increase the income? And the same, at the same time, can we prolong the time of, uh, of the staying of the, of, of, uh, the showing of the, of the film? And even if, can we do, as I said, 40 screens in 23, uh, 40 movies in 23, uh, 23 screens? These are all the, the, the factors that we know about the film that we get. You know, the, the, the rough story, the rough director, and, and all the, the other things that we know. And, and, uh, base, and basing, uh, relying on this, uh, Parameters we have to decide whether to, to use or whether to show this film or not. It's, as you understand, it's a very, very big uh, effort, a very, very big uh, ordeal for us to decide whether to use the, to, to, to screen this, uh, this film. Uh, we use, uh, we are trying, we are, we're now trying to develop some kind of a computer system to, to, that will uh, take all of these factors, make them to some kind of figures or some kind of a prediction, uh, in order for us to use or t as, a, as a decision tool or decision-making tool to decide whether to take the film or whether to uh, in, in, or end in which uh, theater to uh, to show the film.
this is the this is the way that we're trying to uh, to do. We're trying to mark, to give it, each each film a mark in the in the field, trying to sum the to give a, a, a mark to to the film, and and make comparison uh, with all uh, with the database that we have in the cinema about all films that we had, um, and try to to, to do some uh, extrapolation with new movies. It's basically a, a work that we do. It's not just a theory. Although we are in Israel, we are. Uh, no one in the United States or no one in the, in the path industry knows us and think about us and we just, I think, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.00 percent of, uh, of the movie industry, but eventually it's a work that we have, uh, we have to do. What we'd like to do is to develop a, a smart system that will help us uh, mark the same movies and, and help us predict. What, if, I, if, I, if I wasn't in this industry, I would have thought that uh, the distributors of the film or or the producer of the film will give me the, the, the knowledge, the information, the software, some kind of a tool to decide, not, uh, not throw me the film and tell me, okay, you have to decide. So it's a, it's a very problematic industry, and eventually the booker, the guy that works for me, he's the one that deciding for Hollywood what to do. After we get, we're getting the film, okay, and we decided, okay, this is the film that, uh, that we're, going to, uh, we're going to show in the, in the film, uh, the, this is the, the time that starts the hard work. We have to decide which day, which time, how many holes, how many weeks we're going to, uh, to, to show uh, the, the, the movie. Uh, basically, I can tell you that this, uh, this work decides or determines, but actually determines the success uh, of, the, of the film. Uh, if, if we make a mistake and if we uh, valued, uh, make wrong uh, assumption about a certain film, this may kill the film or kill us. Let's say for if, if Avatar, we have decided to put it only in one screen and eventually we had the 200 or 300 percent uh, people that, uh, more people that want to come to the film, maybe in the next, uh, the next week they, they, they will say, okay, we won't come to Cinema City, we'll go to Yes Planet, because uh, in Cinema City you don't have enough, uh, enough places. So it's, it's a very, a very, uh, very uh, difficult, difficult problem for us. Uh, and it goes all the way through the, to the life of a film, what to do in the first week, the second week, the third week, whether to continue with the, with the film. What we, what we, uh, what we, think we found out that is that we can, we can know about certain films uh, that we think that are good films, meaning that uh, it's a, it's, it, for not many people, to our, uh, in our view, have seen the film. It's a good, very good film, and uh, not just thousand people in, in our cinema should see, should see it. We think that 3,000 uh, people more have to, have to see it. So we, what we're trying to do is, a, is the work of, a, let's say, a, taking a certain film and uh, telling our audience, which we don't have any way of speaking to, uh, this is a good film, you have to come and see it again, or you have to come and see it at all in our cinema. Uh, we're trying to do it uh, now develop through the internet network with, let's say, a Facebook uh, group. We're trying to use our uh, uh, internet site, some kind of recommendation system to our uh, customers. We're doing it with our uh, scheduling system. Once we, sleep, we put the same film in the same hall for another week and another week, this hopefully will draw uh, more customers to the cinema because the... From our experience, once the movie is released to, to a cinema, uh, the, the investment in the advertisement or the investment in the, in the show, in the, uh, uh, let's say publishing the film to the audience, it ended. This is the, the, the way that businesses are done now in the film industry. Some of our work is how, how to change the way that the distributors or the producer, or the producers mainly, the, the most of the difference that we can do is with, with Israeli films, are uh, 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 doing by how to uh, one second after drink uh, how do they uh, publish their films Uh, another thing that, that we're doing with the, with the scheduling uh, system is uh, we're trying to, to, to put
put into the, the scheduling system much more variables as you might have uh, seen, or my, my, you might have thought. Uh, in the last, in the, the, all the cinema business scheduling was done, like all the films were starting at 4 o'clock in the, in the evening, the other, the, others, the, the other show was at 7, the other show was at 9. Uh, this is good if you have uh, two screens and you don't want to, uh, and, you, and, you, and you're from the old business, but once you have uh, 22, 23, screen, 23 screens or 26 screens, what we are building now in Rishon Etzion, it's a problem because you, can, you cannot uh, absorb as many, uh, as much people at the same time at the parking or at the, or at the popcorn stand. And this is one way of looking at it. The other way is we want to give the audience uh, the, the possibility to come at each, each 15 minutes and, uh, and see a different movie. People can come to the cinema uh, whenever they want, at what time they want of the day, and each 15 minutes a movie that they are interested in will start. Uh, it's, a, it's a very big problem when, when you're trying to schedule 120 sh or 180 shows a day, each day, all over the week. It's a very, very big, uh, big problem. Uh, we're doing it uh, manually and uh, as a marketing or as a, as a goal, we, we're trying to, to, input, to insert a computer or decision-making tool to this, uh, to this system. Another thing that we, that we are trying to, to predict with the film is uh, we're trying to, to find out uh, about each certain film, uh, how to, to put it in scheduling as, uh, with, with the knowledge of the, of the possible success or possible uh, behavior of, of the film in, in our cinema. Regular films start as a, at a medium or a high uh, a request or a high demand by the, by the viewers, and it goes down along the, the weeks. Some of the films, like in the second line, the Zbeng Gamano films, uh, started, the, let's say, they, they have an actor like, let's say, Bruce Willis, but it's a rubbish film. Start very high because everybody comes to see to see a Bruce Willis. Uh, after two two three weeks or two three days, people say, using the word of mouth, it's a it's a bad film. Don't come. We try to predict this behavior, and let's say in the two three uh, days or first or second week of the film, give the film a lot of holes, a lot of seat, that the, all the demands for the film will will be accomplished. Some kind of. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we, maybe we're not doing uh, so well with our customers, but for us it's, it's the way of doing business. Uh, the, the, the fourth one, the, the raising number, of, the, the raising number of, of places. This is a, as long as the movie runs in the cinema, we pay less uh, to the to the producers. We, we play, pay less to the distributors of, of the film. So as long as we, we can uh, show the film in our cinema with a reasonable amount of viewers, we get uh, more money to, to our cinemas. Uh, so what we, we find out that, that we, can, we can take one film uh, and t break out from the, from the parading, the, the, the convention that say, okay, each film have to pay, we have three shows a day in the, in the afternoon at uh, 7 o'clock, at 9 o'clock, and, and, uh, and make or find one show a, a day, uh, let's say about a film that runs six to eight weeks in our cinema, give them one show. The, the art is to find the, the right time, the right show, and the, the right uh, hall to put uh, the cinema in the right days, and to have the, the same amount of viewers that you, you, you will have in, in three shows in one show. By this, you can, for us, increase the number of films, uh, address more audience, give them more possibility, more, uh, more, uh, more films to see, and not just focus on the, the, the big hits. Uh, if in, a, in an average year you have, let's say, well, some kind of a 250 uh, different movies a year, between 20 to, uh, to 50 of them are the big, uh, the big box, the big hits. The other 200 is the, the average films, this is the, the, our main product that, that, that we supply, and uh, we have, to, we, we have to, to live in this, uh, let's say, medium product uh, environment, and we have to, to, to use or take this, uh, this medium product uh, and, and uh, give, try to, uh, to attend or uh, to attract the uh, audiences that, as the same of, uh, as, as a number uh, as the other 50. It's, it's a big problem. Using this uh, 
this certain or the one one film scheduling a process or one film a know-how we're trying to to correct or find from the these 200 uh, films the films that we can prolong prolong their uh, their duration or prolong their uh, screening time in uh, in cinema uh, as you see get, get the, the name gambling uh, most of our industry is some kind of a, a big casino because basically we don't know nothing we're playing with the with the variables uh, that basically all, uh, our audiences have uh, know them as they have the audience have the knowledge we don't have nothing and we have to predict what will our uh, customers do if, if you try to think why you go to uh, to see a certain film basically you don't know nothing about the film you maybe know the, the name of the actor uh, maybe you know the the poster of the film maybe you heard it on it on, on the radio let's say it's, it's a lot of uh, of, of things that are not di uh, directly related uh, related to the to the film, uh, as opposed to the to the second or third week of, uh, of of the screening where the word of mouth is doing the the best or doing the the most of for uh, for uh, for the film. Uh, so our our basic uh, work or very hard work is how to, to to try to find if the word of mouth. Is is right or good? Is doing good for for the film? In the in the in the, in the, in the best in the three weeks uh, in the first weeks is to see if the the work that is done by the distributors and uh, by the producers is as good as that that, they, that our customers will like or will want to see. Uh, so it's kind of some kind of uh, walking it, uh, walking on eggs or uh, trying to, to to guess the right number in a, in a casino uh, uh, of films. Some, I'll give you some new thoughts that uh, we're trying to uh, to implement in our in our cinemas. Those thoughts are, are intended to to make uh, our to, to give our, our audience some kind of a free uh, free way of, of choosing the film that they want to see. Trying to help us do our our work. I'll, find, I'll start from the from the from the down. It's I call it COD. It's it's, it's after the the VOD thing that that, that you know is. Trying to, to to develop a system of giving our audience uh, the possibility to choose the films that we, that they will see uh, on cinema. Since if if you take the, the average things of, of all the things that I uh, said or the know the how know of the of the, of the business, eventually the, our customers know the, the thing the films that they want to see. If I give our my customers the, the ability to choose the film that will be, will be screened on cinema and make some kind of a film market, we 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 will give the the audiences the, the ability to to uh, to uh, to mark the, the films that they want to see, and from them we will we will show the films that are doing the best. Uh, hopefully, this will draw the, the most of the people to the cinema. Uh, as a way of saying, okay, these are the films that, that we want to see, and we, this will help us, or maybe help the industry, uh, put the right films at the right time uh, for our audience. Once uh, the, the, uh, the, the I'll, I'll just say the, the last one: Can we choose the film for uh, our, our audiences? Uh, as, a, as a person that works for, in this industry, eventually you you often you know. Uh, which films are, are good, which films can succeed, which film uh, our audiences have not seen, and it's a shame, or, a, or as, as we say in Hebrew, it's chaval that, they, that you haven't seen the, the, the film. Uh, what we're trying to, to develop in our small, uh, in small, uh, small cinema or small uh, exhibitor, that, you know, that the, last, uh, the last frontier of the, of the cinema industry is, 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 a, is, a, is a way for us as a cinema to push the audiences to see a certain uh, film. Not there. We haven't developed a, a, a scientific approach uh, to it, but it's a, it's a, it's a method that, that we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Since we are running a little bit late, what I suggest we are going to do is we're going to wrap up right now, and two speakers will stay with us for a few minutes. If anyone wants to ask a question, I want you to step here and chat with them. So thank you very much. Okay. 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 Okay.